Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. All right guys, this is it. We have about 48 hours until we are unequivocally at war with the Russians. Now, 32 chiefs of defense from all the NATO states, including Finland and Sweden, who are not NATO members yet, but this is foreshadowing, of course, are going to be converging on U.S. Ramstein Air Base on January 20th to talk about how they are going to fight the Russians. Guys, this is big. In the same week, we have two other meetings happening. We have a meeting with the top dog in the U.S. military, not the top dog dog, but next to Lloyd Austin is Mark Milley, okay, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, meeting with the commander of Ukrainian Armed Forces, Zaluzny, on the border of Poland and Ukraine at a secret location. That meeting is transpiring as we speak. This is something that hasn't happened before. I need to emphasize this has not happened before. On the same week, you have the World Economic Forum perfectly timed to fall right before this meeting at U.S. Ramstein Air Base. Guys, this is huge. This will be a watershed benchmark moment in the timeline of escalatory events towards World War III. I mean, this is crazy. This could be the week that this is the make or break week. If NATO doesn't decide to go all in at this point, then maybe there's some hope that peace can be achieved. But I'm thinking that if we're taking Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the head of the European Commission, and uh, Jen Stoltenberg, and Biden, and Blinken, and all these people on their word, including Ukraine, that they are going to support Ukraine to the bitter end, do you seriously think that that is going to be achieved by 14 Challenger tanks from the UK, or a few HIMAR systems, or some Patriot systems, or some Leopard 2 systems? No. What this means is that this is just the beginning. These 32 guys would not be meeting about this situation for no reason. Okay, this is big. And you got to think, if you're Vladimir Putin right now, and you have all of these chiefs of staff of all the militaries that you're against, who the NATO, the body of NATO was effectively designed to fight the Russians, all in one place, you got to know that his finger is hovering over the hypersonic button right now because he could probably do a serious decapitation strike if he wanted to. I'm not saying he's going to do that. Of course, that would elicit a nuclear response from NATO, the likes of which this world has never seen and hopefully we never see. But what this all means is that the shit's going to hit the fan, okay? Unless, unless common sense prevails. And at this point in time, I don't even think there's an option for negotiation because the Russians aren't buying it. That's the whole problem, is that the Russians no longer trust the West. And uh, this could be the, the point, uh, the inflection point in the conflict because they couldn't just do this right from the start. Imagine February 24th. The U.S. immediately says, we're going to send HIMARS, we're going to send Patriots, and the U.K. is like, okay, we're going to send tanks, Germany's going to do this. What do you think would happen? The next day, a big bomb would be dropped, okay? And you would have guys in hazmat suits out looking for people who've survived the blast. That's what would happen. So this is incremental. This is mission creep. This is slowly tiptoeing in. Mission creep, as it's called. Because right now, this is an attritional war, and apparently the Ukrainians have a higher burn rate than the Russians. That means they are losing more troops and resources in this attritional campaign. This is why they're reaching out for support. And we've been told time and time again that the Russians are running out of weapons. Well, it doesn't seem like they are at this point in time. And in fact, the Russians are going to be expanding their military, as we've been saying for the longest time, and they're very clever in how they're wording this. One thing you got to hand it to the Russians, and I don't speak to this from a place of preference, is that they're very good with the, the English language. They're very just good with uh, linguistically, period, in terms of their propaganda campaigns. I mean, the Z campaign was genius. I mean, just one letter to symbolize the whole operation. I mean, that campaign in itself is genius. But the way they euphemistically term everything from like special military operation to now they're saying we're going to mobilize, uh, we're going to expand our forces till, uh, by 2026. What they probably aren't saying is that 99% of that is going to come in the next six months. 
and maybe that extra 1%, we're going to keep on recruiting because 1.5 million, of course, is only the beginning. Now, we got a lot of stuff to talk about today. If you don't think that we're in a hot war with the Russians, leave it to our Davos correspondent. I talked about Davos, didn't I? The three meetings happening this week, the World Economic Forum at Davos, the meeting with Milly and uh, Zaluzny on the Ukrainian border, and these 32 uh, chiefs of staff meeting in Ramstein Air Base. This is a week for the World War III ages. Now, let's hear what Ian Bremmer, the correspondent in Davos, has to say via Yahoo Finance, okay? This is important. If you don't think that we're in a hot war, this is what all of the heads of state want to say but can't say. Because if they said it, shit would change real fast. Listen to this. I think what we have to understand is that there's been 30 years of peace dividend that the Europeans have benefited for, from. It's over. And we're not in a cold war with Russia. We're in a hot war with Russia that we're fighting by proxy in Ukraine. But uh, Russia's ability to use disinformation, to engage in cyber attacks against critical infrastructure, to blow up pipelines or fiber, um, to have proxy um, engagement vis and terrorism um, on the ground in NATO, those are now active threats that Europeans principally are going to have to defend themselves against. That is absolutely underpriced in the market. <laughs> underpriced in the market. Yeah, tell me about it. Um, principally Europeans. Now, the reason why what he just said is so important, number one, he basically confessed and you don't get to where he is by not being in the know, okay? Uh, he basically confessed that we're at war, we're at a proxy war with the Russia. It's not really a proxy war because we're fighting the Russians. It would be a proxy war if it was a proxy war since 2014. A proxy war is when you have two armies that are supporting two groups that are fighting with one each other at least that's how i would uh, that's how i would properly term a proxy war we are literally fighting the russians okay there's a big difference there this is not like afghanistan or something like that this is not vietnam where we're fighting the chinese by proxy no we're fighting the russians and that is very dangerous for obvious nuclear reasons but the other thing he said was the possibility for cyber attack. That has been the going theme of Davos. If you haven't seen our many videos that we've done on cyber attack and the prospect for a major catastrophic cy uh, cyber attack that would compromise one of the 12 areas of critical infrastructure that act as cornerstones of our society, then you better go and check those videos out. Because right now, the World Economic Forum has in all of their intellectual splendor have come to the conclusion, we're skipping ahead a little bit here, that um, a catastrophic cyber attack is very likely in the next two years. When I say very likely, we're talking about 93%. Okay, 93% of their experts, of the 300 experts, claim that cyber attack, we're talking about a catastrophic that word catastrophic is not a word that you use loosely. That is, a, that is suggesting that we're likely going to see something compromised in our critical infrastructure. Now, I speculated yesterday, I did the tinfoil hat video, it was late at night, I was feeling kind of zany, so I released that cut that suggested maybe this is how they're going to prevent bank runs in the future. They're just going to say, oh, cyber attack, sorry, you can't take out your money. There's a problem with the banks. Maybe that's what they're going to do. Because if Russia starts winning this war, and if we start losing this war, Saudi Arabia is always, already talking about diversifying in terms of which currencies they're going to sell their oil, their crude in. And as Saudi Arabia goes, so goes the world in terms of oil. Anyways, that is going to drastically weaken the dollar. De-dollarization will commence. People will start to get panicky. Just like he said, the markets could potentially tank. It's not priced into the market. None of this cyber attack business is priced into the market. But the thing that they're saying here is geopolitical instability raises the threat. Well, what are they talking about there? Just put Russia. Just put Russian threat of global cy catastrophic cyber attack in the next two years is likely. Okay, that's what they need to put there. Because there's a contradiction going on here. 
On the one hand, the World Economic Forum is saying, hey, we need to get in there like a dirty shirt, fight the Russians, help the Ukrainians push the Russians all the way back to Crimea to give Vladimir Putin an excuse to use a nuclear weapon. And on the other hand, they're saying, well, we also got to prepare for a catastrophic cyber attack due to geopolitic, geopolitical instability that we're really not willing right now to sit down and negotiate over. They're saying that they're willing to negotiate, but only with preconditions that neither side is willing to accept. So we know that the only potential outcome then is that one side gets destroyed, at least as things are right now. And I cannot see that situation changing because neither side trusts the other side. Lavrov already came out today and he said, it's over. I mean, it's literally over. Nothing is ever going to be the same with them. And they've even backed out of, well, we got to talk about that too. Uh, they're set to renounce charters and treaties related to the Council of Europe. So these charters that Russia has shared with Europe, these treaties related to human rights and things of that nature, are now null and void. We have the New START Treaty that is now null and void. That's strategic arms reduction, nuclear weapons reduction between Russia and the United States. That's pretty much out the window. And at the same time, what else do we got going on here? Well, I got a, I got a show for you guys today. The EU has set up a nuclear stockpile on the Russian border. What great place to put a nuclear stockpile. Is this a harbinger for what's to come? Finland will be home to a strategic reserve for atomic and chemical emergency response equipment. Now, what I kind of found funny, and they're, they're saying that what this is going to be is it's going to be if there's a nuclear incident in Europe anywhere, it's going to, this resource is going to be distributed from that central spot. Uh, why they put it in Finland, God only knows. One thing I found kind of amusing is that they say that these supplies will include critical medical countermeasures. And remember, this is for the purpose of chemical and nuclear incidents primarily, although they have biological in there as a footnote. Uh, this is going to include vaccines and antidotes, first and foremost, because when your skin's on fire and you're puking your guts out from acute radiation sickness, the first thing you need is your fourth booster. I just found that flipping hilarious. Didn't Biden say something like that? Like during hurricane season, one of the first things people need is they need to get their jab. Hey, I'm not saying anything against it. I think, you know, it's, you know, if you think it's a good thing to do, then do it. I'm just saying maybe priorities. Maybe we need a little bit more triage in our nuclear stockpile. Okay. So anyways, that's not looking good. Uh, like I said, Mark Milley meeting Valerie Zaluzny near the Ukrainian border for the first time ever. This is the first. So well, meetings like this have happened in the past amongst NATO chiefs of defense. It's a first because you have these other things happening at the same time and you know that this World Economic Forum conference was there to, to kind of nudge everyone in that direction. Now, there's a lot of people who didn't show at the WEF this year. And a lot of people are speculating, well, you know, maybe uh, people are just losing interest in it. But I think it's more to do with the fact that people are scrambling to figure out how to fight the Russians. I think that's because there's a lot of uh, changes in the ranks right now in Germany. Okay, we have the defense minister who has just been canned, resigned. Apparently, she was not hard enough. She was not hawkish enough on the Russians. So they're putting this new guy in who is probably going to have to prove himself and earn his stripes. Boris Pistorius. Now, that's a name for the ages. Boris Pistorius. you got to love that name. Uh I can't say that we're going to love the man, but, you know, we've got to love the name. Now, this guy is likely going to put Germany on the warpath with Russia, possibly, or could do the complete opposite. But it's starting to look like that's what's about to happen here, okay? You're having this meeting in Ramstein Air Force Base. The U.S. is sending their top guy to talk to the Ukrainians. What are they talking about? Are they saying, hey, it's time to fold it, it's time to pack it in, it's time to make some concessions? Or do you think they're going to say it's time to win? Now, if they're saying it's time to win, then they're saying that nuclear war is on the horizon. 
And we're going to get to that in just a minute. According to Ursula von der Leyen, West should supply Ukraine with weapons it needs and can handle. Emphasis on that. And that's a prudent thing to say because you don't want to be just sending everything in there willy-nilly, just this mishmash of stuff. And of course, what this means, guys, is there are going to be a whole lot of mercs, a whole lot more mercs, okay, who are not speaking Ukrainian, put it that way. And uh, there's plenty of videos surfacing of non-Ukrainian speakers fighting on the ground. What else is new? Okay, let's see what Christia Freeland, our Deputy Prime Minister, has to say about this situation. She's going to tell us the one thing that we can do as financial, as a leaders of finance for our countries, this is the one thing that we can do to make the world a better place, okay? Get a load of this. We need to use. Um, it's not about doing Ukraine favors um, that we're talking about. Supplying Ukraine with weapons and as President Zelensky very crucially pointed out, supplying Ukraine with the money it needs to win the war is ultimately in our own self-interest. So I'm a finance minister. And if you were to say to me, what... This is like a try not to laugh challenge, okay? Try not to laugh, guys. What is the one thing that G7 finance ministers, G7 governments this year could do. This, this is next in line to Trudeau. Just, just remember that. Actually in our power, right? We don't control COVID. We don't control global supply chains. We don't control whether there will be immaculate disinflation or not. One thing where we have some... You know she, she said that in a mirror many, many times before she came on stage. Immaculate disinflation? Come on real practical levers is we can help Ukraine win clearly, definitively. And if we do that, if that happens this year, you know it as well as I do, Fareed. That would be a huge boost to the global economy. <laughs> I failed miserably. Um, let's see what she's talking about when she says uh, it's going to be a boost to the global economy. Uh, let's just see if we can find... Uh, I was going to Google a nuclear explosion, but anyways, as you can kind of see, I was Googling a polar bear Alaska attack. Unfortunately, tragic incident happened in Alaska where a polar bear just uh, went crazy in a town and started attacking people, and fortunately, somebody died. Anyways, um, it's going to end in a nuclear explosion, and that's going to be great for the global economy. Well done. Well done. She has my vote. So these are the people who are in charge. I mean, they seriously expect a thinking person to believe that this is an existential war for Russia. We know that. That is 100% true. It doesn't matter if we believe it, the Russians believe it. If the Russians lose, they push the nuclear button. She's saying that if that happens, the economy is going to do well. I mean, what sort of fantasy land are these people living in? Anyways, what else do we got? Oh, yeah, uh, cool factor, tactical. Canadians are sending 200 of these bad boys to the Ukrainians. Now, even though it's probably going to get blown to smithereens, unfortunately, that is a freaking cool ride, man. I mean, I would be canceling my Cybertruck uh, reservation for this in a hot minute. That is a Mad Max vehicle if I ever seen one. I didn't know we made bad badass stuff like that. I don't know if we make that or where it's made, but that is freaking cool. Oh, what else do we got going on here? Okay. Um, I talked about Moscow renouncing charters and treaties. Yeah, it's all falling apart this week, guys. And of course, as I've been saying for the longest time, Russia's boosting their military. Uh, to 1.5 million. Euphemistically, of course, they're saying that we're going to expand our military by 2026. But what that means is that they're going to bring in the first 99% in the next six months and, you know, they'll continue the mobilization from there. Fort Hood's Blackjack Brigade preparing to deploy to Europe. This is actually a week old story. So they're deploying another 4,000 U.S. troops to 
Europe. I'm not sure where in Europe, but that's bringing the troop numbers in Europe pretty high, pretty highly elevated. And I think, have I talked about the catastrophic cyber attack in the next two years? So we know that 93% of Davos experts, of these 300 experts, have determined that the risk of a catastrophic cyber attack in the next two years is very likely. And they use the term catastrophic cyber attack and very likely with a lot of conviction. They repeat this over and over again like they know it's going to happen. Now, if you missed my tinfoil hat video I did yesterday, go and check it out. It was late at night. Like I say, I was kind of zany, so I might have said some weird things. But I suspect that maybe the cyber attack is going to be some sort of smoke screen cover, false flag, thingamajigger in order to prevent people from taking out their money when the U.S. dollar really starts to take a nosedive. So it's kind of a, a ruse to protect against a bank run. This could be a card they play. On the one hand, they're pushing us into nuclear Armageddon with the Russians, and then they're saying, well, this might cause geo inst <laughs> geopolitical instability. Well, one way to reconcile that might be to not engage in a nuclear war with the Russians, just saying maybe we can go to the negotiating table without preconditions. Maybe Russia decides to back out at the end of the day. Maybe nothing comes of it. At least let's start a conversation. But hey, if you say something like that, you get put on a hit list. So I'm not saying that. I'm just saying somebody else is saying that. Global Cybersecurity Outlook 2023. So this is their insight report. So of course, they're writing this from the perspective of how can we make lots of money on these coming crises that we are going to be the ones who create it. And here we go. Let's uh, see what these geniuses have to say. Let's see what they have in store for us. Uh, Global Security Outlook uh, Report 2023. This is a result of uh, research in collaboration with the forum's communities and our partner Accenture, in which we've uh, interviewed and sought input from over 300 executives globally. The most striking finding that we found is that 93% of cyber leaders and 86% of cyber business leaders believe that the geopolitical instability makes a catastrophic cyber event likely in the next two years all right so you heard it there catastrophic cyber attack very likely because we're going to war with russia so get ready get ready to not be able to access your money in the bank get ready for grid down power failures get ready for contamination of the water supply get ready for uh, the internet to maybe just stop working suddenly wouldn't that be a doozy hey could you imagine could you imagine how depressed i mean the, the whole generation of people who grew up thinking the internet was something as certain as the sun coming up in the morning and for them to not have access to it i mean that's going to create a crisis could be the best thing that ever happened to humanity but not before people go through some pretty excessive tech withdrawal. Elon Musk, gotta love Elon, man. I, I like this guy more and more by the day. He's basically saying that he isn't at Davos because it's boring AF. <laughs> Organizers say they haven't invited him since 2015 anyways. So that's kind of funny. It's amusing how they're crapping on the one guy who's supposedly bringing forth technology that's in line with this, at least on paper. I'm not saying that the cobalt mines and the efficiency of lithium mining and this and that and overwhelming the grids. I'm not talking about whether or not. I'm just saying on the surface, this is, this is supposed to be the green tech guy, right? But they're, you know, giving them the cold shoulder. And they're putting uh, Greta Thunberg in jail. But that, that kind of looks like it reminds me of an episode of uh, Trailer Park Boys when J-Rock intentionally gets arrested so that he can get a picture for his album cover. Uh, I'm kind of getting those vibes from that. I'm not saying that the cause isn't real. I'm not saying it's not a good thing, because check this out. I'm just saying that, you know, how they're playing it is kind of weird. Uh, the East Coast is getting lit up. Look at that. That is abnormally warm tempers, temperatures from Mexico all the way up to the Maritimes, up to Iqaluit, okay? And, uh, and Labrador and all these weird places up here in Canada where nobody lives. 
but this is this is crazy this is just non-stop and europe still hasn't seen winter yet their natural gas reserves are higher than ever before unbelievable stuff is happening natural gas reserves higher than ever before and all of that came from liquid natural gas and the only reason is because Temperatures in Europe have been well above normal for months and months. Now we're entering what they call El Nino, which is supposed to bring even warmer temperatures. I don't know, man, the, the stage is set for some pretty freaking hot temperatures this summer. All I can say is that if you can afford an air conditioner, get one before summer. Get an air conditioner now if you live in some of these places where you're not accustomed to having air conditioners because there's going to be a run on air conditioners and air conditioners is only going to make the problem worse in the end because air conditioners actually create heat they cause the uh, urban heat island effect what else do we got going on here we got f food prices at a 45 year high despite slight dip in inflation figures show and that's not looking to slow down at all not one bit the CEO of Unilever says we may, have to, we may have seen the peak of inflation. That doesn't mean inflation is going to stop. That might mean we'll see some disinflation. doesn't mean deflation. I should probably just do a quick video on the difference between inflation, disinflation, and deflation. Because it's a simple concept, but not everybody is aware of it. And I didn't even really know the distinction a few years ago. So I'm not playing Mr. Smarty Pants here. But anyways, the reason why they're saying this is is because... The purchaser uh, price index is not on par with the consumer price index. So that the people who make the stuff, get all the raw materials, manufacture it and distribute it, they haven't passed all those prices on to the consumer yet in spite of the fact that maybe their prices are starting to come down or CPI overall is going down. So what they're saying is that prices are still going to continue to go up until they're at parity with the purchaser price increases. Saudi Arabia says it's opening, open to settling trade in other currencies. This is a death knell for the US dollar because as goes Saudi Arabia, at least in the oil market, so goes the world. So expect that some people in Washington are panicking. And I don't think they like the fact that, actually I shouldn't say that, I think uh, this whole, you know, this whole climate thing is working out to the U.S. advantage right now because it's keeping oil prices relatively low. But even still, they're saying that oil prices are expected to rise to 140 bucks a barrel this year because of what's happening with China. If China reopens, God only knows what's happening in China. And the lack of media attention towards the issue makes me think that maybe they just want it to spread again because nobody's talking about it nearly enough. With all the crazy stories coming out of there, something is going on. Some actionable information for you guys. Physicists have run a study and they say they found the best place to hide indoors from a nuclear shockwave. And what you want to do is if you're you know, just outside the blast zone, obviously, if you're in the epicenter of this sort of thing, you're going to get uh, fried by the, the heat energy. But if you're outside of that and somehow you're, you're still, you're not prepared, you don't have a bunker, you don't have a basement, you got nowhere else to go, the best thing you can do in that situation is go towards the corner of the building from which the bomb has originated. So if the bomb is over there, that's the corner of the building that I want to be in because that means the blast wave is going to blow over and if you are in this corner of the building over here well you're probably going to get some projectile in the head or the face at least that corner that's like one of the strongest parts of the building facing the blast kind of counterintuitive but somewhat not I've also heard it said that if you find yourself out on the street and a bomb drops one of the best things you can do if you are you know outside of the the epicenter of the, the thermal energy and you're just kind of in the blast zone is get down on the ground if you can't like if you're in a flat place where you have there's no place to take shelter you uh face down on the ground hands over your head like you're preparing to be attacked by a grizzly bear um, not in the fetal position but just faced away from the bomb so that way if the blast 
hits you, it's not hitting your skull, it's not hitting your vitals. So you're face down, lying down on in towards the direction uh, away from, sorry, away from the bomb. <laughs> it's hard to explain spatial things with words. Anyways, guys, that's what I got for you today. Let me know what you think in the comment section below, but it's happening. I would say that this meeting at Ramstein Air Base is critical. This is pivotal. This will be possibly the watershed moment when we fully commit to this war. And in doing so, the response from the Russians, because right now what's about to happen, they all know what's about to happen. Belarus and Russia have been doing joint exercises till February 1st. The rumblings that the major offensive is just over the horizon and uh, they have to make a choice. They have to make a choice if they are going to fight or flight or try to stall anymore. They know the Russians aren't falling for stalling. <laughs> no pun intended. Anyways, guys, let me know what you think in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Canadian Prepper out.